up in our field. And uh, I'm going to put him on the Central Central Committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We think it's a great great place, great energy. Welcome. Good morning. I'm Amira de la Garza, and on behalf of ASU's Faculty Women of Color Caucus, I'm delighted to welcome you today to the event Creating Success by Whom We Include, a dialogue with ASU President Michael M. Crow. The Faculty Women of Color Caucus is a gathering of ASU faculty committed to changing the climate at ASU through dialogue and positive action. We encourage the hosting of forums for students, staff, faculty, and administrators where topics of relevance to a healthy climate of inclusion can be discussed in a critical and inviting manner. We believe this can contribute to the transformation of our university climate so that our charter of inclusivity becomes a lived reality. We're especially grateful to President Crow for his interest in today's dialogue, which will be facilitated by a founding member of the Faculty Women of Color Caucus. Please pick up one of our flyers, the Marigold Sheets, if you've not already done so for information on how to get on our mailing list or sign up for listserv announcements. Please allow me to introduce my longtime friend and comadre, Delia Sáenz, who will be introducing today's participants, providing some housekeeping and uh, format guidance and will be facilitating the discussion today. Thank you very much again for your presence. Gracias, Amira. Again, I'm Delia Sines, and I'll be as brief as I can so we can get to the heart of the matter today. Uh, as my colleague Amira mentioned, we are launching a dialogue about inclusion in higher education. This is an important conversation on our campus and all across the nation. We'll begin with remarks from President Crow, about 15 to 20 minutes, and then presentations of about 8 to 10 minutes each from our distinguished panelists. I will serve as the timekeeper and the enforcer. <laughs> each participant on the panel will introduce themselves by name and title. Each plays a very critical role at our university. Many questions were submitted to us through the RSVP process, and I thank you for taking the time to do that. We won't be able to get through all of them. Uh, in their remarks, the speakers have been asked to hit upon some of these inquiries. And time allowing, I may ask additional ones from the list that came in, and maybe two or three questions from the floor. But again, it depends on our time. I will take uh, a moment to address one of the questions that was submitted, which basically was, why this particular configuration of speakers? The Faculty Women of Color Caucus selected them specifically because of their demonstrated commitment to inclusion and because they reflect many, though not all, of the identities that comp comprise our community. In fact, if we consider everyone on this stage, myself included, we reflect a tapestry of differences, inclusive of gender, ethnicity, race, social class upbringing, first generation, ableness, sexual orientation, faith tradition, and probably a few other dimensions, visible and non, as well as their intersections. As importantly, the areas of expertise and function span academics, culture and arts, vulnerable student populations, athletics, and community engagement, among others. Fortunately, we can think of this event as one of many dialogues that can and will transpire at ASU. Each and every one of us can own the opportunity and the responsibility to create dialogue events or interactions across all permutations of identity, diversity, and inclusion. I encourage you to do so. So I thank you for asking that question and for respecting the choices that we made with these particular panelists. I also thank you for your time commitment, not just in attending today, but in being thoughtful, intentional, and proactive every day around the task of inclusion at ASU, in line with the demonstrable efforts of our colleagues and leaders on stage. I have three housekeeping details. 
First, please mute your cell phones and or other devices. Second, before you leave, introduce yourself to someone you don't know, but who's a member of your community and mine, ASU. And there goes a device right on time. <laughs> Third, let's start with thanking our speakers for all that they do to model inclusivity. So President Crow, you're up first. Thank you, uh, Delia, and thank you to all of you for taking time from your uh, busy schedules to be here to be a part of this discussion and this dialogue. I thought what I would do in the few minutes that I have is uh, speak uh, very directly about uh, our purpose as an institution, our purpose within this society, and the basic theory of action under which we are advancing. And so the best way for me to do that is to uh, remind everyone, even though you don't need any reminder, that uh, we are a public university serving the people of a democratic republic. A democratic republic that is uh, young in age, uh, has only experienced in the last 50 or 60 years uh, uh, dramatic movement toward its actual, uh, what I call democratic actualization, that is, attaining some of the things that our founding parents articulated in theory. And so I wanted to walk through some of this, and since we are at a university, I thought I would uh, bore you a little bit with uh, a philosophical construct before I take that philosophical construct and move it into our theory of action. Uh, one of the people that I read long ago in graduate school uh, who only wrote this particular piece of work, and nearly all of his work was only written in German, and most of it was never translated. And I neither speak nor read German, but I did have access to a German dictionary. <laughs> so can you imagine taking a philosophical piece and deciphering it word by word by word by word? You come to materially integrate it into your mindset. So this particular philosopher's name is Lorenz von Stein. He was a sort of a philosopher of, uh, of uh, public evolution, uh, the state, uh, public administration, and economics. And he had this theory of the state uh, around this idea of what he called self, will, and deed. There is that self that you hope to aspire to attain. In our country, that's articulated often incorrectly these days in the public media as the Constitution and all that followed it, meaning all of its interpretations since being written, so that's the self, that's what we're attempting to actualize toward. All people are created equal, everyone has access to liberty, justice will be equally available to all that live in the country, et cetera, et cetera. These unbelievable ideals that humans have never been able to attain. That writing, that self-actualization, that self-idealization that von Stein talked about long before he spent any time looking at the American Constitution, uh, is what we aspire to be. Then the next part of his theory is the will. So you have this thing you're trying to be, then there's the exercise of your willpower. What do you actually hope to achieve? You want to do this. You'd like to be uh, a more egalitarian culture. You'd like to achieve higher levels of fairness. You'd like the police not to beat people for no particular reason at all. You'd like all these things to occur because they're all about you aspiring to your self-actualized identity. But you don't always pull it off. It's what you hope to be versus what you actually do. And then the last part of von Stein's theory is the deed, the measurement of your actual progress towards the self-actualized or self-idealized goal. So looking at that, our self actualized goal from our founder's theory is that our democracy would be built on these unbelievable human objectives of equality, of liberty, of fairness, of equal justice, and all those things that made the framers of this, of this construct that we call the United States outlined for us. But it was, in fact, a theory, a theory. Several of them were slaveholders. They obviously had a different view about who was a human. 
what kind of humans we had, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's, it's like these same people are producing these ideas, but they didn't even understand necessarily the definition of human meant human, person meant person. We've come over time through struggle, through conflict, through fighting, through arguing, through the law, the power of the law, the rule of law, to make many, many corrections, but not all of the corrections that needed to be made. But one of the founders assumptive theories was also about the role of education. And Adams, who made a significant contribution to the establishment of the United States and was an unbelievable idealist who lived a life that was consistent in many ways with his ideals, he also had some things to say about the role of education. And one of those uh, things that he had to say about the role of education was that it was essential to the success of the democracy that the democracy could not be successful unless education was a key element of it. So having said that, it also turns out that Washington, well, Adams, by the way, said that in his authorship of parts of the Massachusetts Constitution in 1780. Washington, in his first speech to Congress in 1790, again said that the education of the people was central to the success of our society and our dreams and our aspirations. And Jefferson, a complicated man, you know, who obviously had a life and a series of life choices that, uh, you know, he had his own children that he left in slavery after his death. It's like an inexplicable thing. It's beyond any intellectual, you can see I'm less fond of him, uh, perhaps, <laughs> than, 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 than others. Uh, but nonetheless, he had an idea about education also through his creation of the University of Virginia. So let's think of our founder's theory as being the advancement of something that each of them participated in writing, the Constitution. Each of them in one way or another fought, and, and some significantly, uh, to see it come about. But they had a theory about education. Now their theory about education remains unimplemented in this country. It remains unimplemented in this country. We still have disparity in educational institutions. We have class-based differences in educational outcomes. We have parents' incomes still determining educational outcomes, are still heavily influencing educational outcomes. And so we've tried different things in education as we've been moving along. And so in practice, we've worked in three different realms to advance the notion of inclusion. Here's where we started, no inclusion. That was our practice. White males went to college. White males from wealthy families went to college. White males from wealthy families who had a particular faith went to college. And if you were Catholic, or if you were not of a particular Protestant faith, or you weren't this, or you weren't that, or you weren't this, or you weren't that, well, too bad. No inclusion. Eventually, we began to see individual institutions begin to emerge, places like Oberlin College, places like some of the land-grant colleges, other institutions that emerged where women were uh, uh, admitted, where uh, uh, African Americans were admitted, where others were admitted. Again, slow, incremental change. And then we began to actually realize some of the negative outcomes associated with attainment of our democracy the actualization of our democracy as a function of the lack of inclusion. So we tried a technique called forced inclusion. Busing in certain neighborhoods in Massachusetts and Yonkers, New York, and all kinds of communities all over the country where somehow we were going to solve this inequity of quality, access to quality education after Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education in the 1950s and all kinds of newer realizations of how we needed to advance our democracy. And so we were going to force inclusion. And then more recently, we've tried what I call bureaucratic inclusion. I'm going to make you be able to count who is in your institution, who works at your institution, who attends your institution, and your numbers need to have a certain matrix of differentiation based on a construct referred to as race or ethnicity or both, and I'm going to make that the practice of inclusion. So we went from no inclusion, purposeful, 
unbelievable negative outcome, forced inclusion, and then bureaucratic inclusion. Now, my analysis of all of them, they're all failures. They're not going to lead to the idealized outcome that the imperfect framers of our construct, the United States, outline. It's not about forcing anything. It's about building institutions who at their very core understand what inclusion is all about, who in their very culture, in their very mechanism, in every decision that they make, whatever those decisions happen to be, they are going to make certain that they are offering the environment in which the democracy can be advanced and there is no non-inclusive behavior. So, this institution, this is a public institution founded in the second wave of, in the, in the second wave of institutional types evolved in the United States, public institutions, teachers college in an Arizona territory long ago that believed itself to be serving the public. Not so much. In 1991, this institution had 3% of its students coming from families eligible for Pell Grants. So think of that as slightly below median income. So meaning slightly less than half the population. So in 1991, this almost free public institution with very few other choices in this community had 3% of its population eligible for, to receive a Pell Grant to help pay for the cost of education, 3%. In 2002, it was slightly above 10%. In 2016, it's around 40%. So our approach has been to reject the notion of bureaucratic models for inclusion, to reject the notion of forced models of inclusion, to obviously reject the model of no inclusion, to make inclusivity the first demonstrable statement of our university charter, which we now have. We will be measured on who we include and how they succeed, not who we exclude, making that a core element of our culture, which is not easy, because we all come from different backgrounds and then we come together here and then we're trying to build a new culture. We're trying to make the university reflective of this new culture. So our approach has been to alter culture. But it has also been necessary along the way for which I remember being more than casually uh, criticized to defeat bureaucratic inclusion. So this is no joke. In the first two years that I was here, I was told that our principal objective relative to inclusion was to have fantastic reports to the government mm -hmm. about the diversity of our staff and the diversity of our students and this and this and this, and that that was our objective. And my conclusion to that was, I don't want to hear any of this anymore. I wasn't interested in what it said on a report about inclusion. I was interested in whether or not we actually had an inclusive community. Did we have everyone moving towards supporting the idea of inclusion? Was inclusion a core value system of the institution? Would you be rejected by this institution as a leader or as a faculty member if you didn't believe in inclusion? The answer now is yes. You're, you, know, you're, you go work somewhere else. Somewhere in the past, I refer to that as. <laughs> Somewhere where the world is not moving forward. And there's lots of those places. I hear about them on television every night. And so, to me, inclusion is in fact the objective. So Adams, even in his conceptualization of higher education, and his conception of democracy never imagined the democracy that we have. 
impossible for him to have conceived of 323 million people with shortly to be quote unquote no majority population by our historical measures of diversity which may or may not be the most meaningful measures of diversity going forward. They're certainly measures of diversity. They may not be the most meaningful measures of diversity in the past. And so there was no way to conceptualize that for our society to achieve the goals of democracy, you cannot have an inequitable distribution of the core asset of education. You cannot have it. The democracy is thus defeated. So, inclusion is our objective. When you make inclusion the objective, guess what happens? Everything starts to change. I saw uh, Kyle Squires in here somewhere, our dean of engineering. He's back in the back back there. So, Kyle has been a part of a team in engineering that has changed engineering to be unbelievably inclusive while still producing world-class engineers. It's not like you make it inclusive by saying, oh, I'm ever so sorry. You know, you don't really understand the math, but that's okay, you don't need it. That would have been me. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's how do we, I'm just picking this one area, how do we change everything? We, change, we, we eliminated our departments, we created grand challenge-oriented schools. We made an objective of inclusivity. Engineering's not been particularly inclusive in terms of educational outcomes in the last few decades. So we doubled the size of our engineering students. We greatly enhanced the freshman retention of our engineering students by 20 points. But we tripled the diversity of our engineering students. We greatly expanded the diversity of our engineering faculty, particularly as it relates to gender. There are some people that would argue, and I would happen to agree with them, that one of the things that has limited us, I'm using this as an example of what inclusion produces as a result, one of the things that has limited us in our ability to best prepare for the world that lies ahead is that our engineers have been too socially narrow. They're not from a broad enough spectrum of backgrounds, personal backgrounds, to give us the wealth of designs that those engineers might produce the wealth of solutions that they might produce, the new ways of looking at things, the new ways of encountering different kinds of problems and different kinds of systems. And so what I'd like to say in my last comment here is that inclusion is the objective in all things. In all things. You cannot have an inclusively successful institution unless the people that work at that institution are representative of that inclusiveness. But even more important than their representativeness of that inclusiveness is their commitment to that inclusiveness as a core outcome, as a core objective. So I'd like to think in closing that we are a manifestation of a new form of public university working to advance the idea of democracy and the power of democracy by advancing a model of inclusion and excellence being combined at the highest possible level attainable that we can presently see, doesn't mean that we can't do better later or there aren't better models than the one we've got on the ground, but the one that we've got now to make all of this happen. And so that's something that I, that I feel that this institution is now committed to in the sense of not only its actualization goal, but the specific metrics that we hold ourselves against and our actual deeds, that is our behavior, who we have here now as students, as faculty members, as the team that's advancing toward this objective. And so inclusion is the objective. If you want democracy to work, it must be the objective. So thank you. <laughs> 18 minutes, 52 seconds. <laughs> Great. I'm Colleen Jennings Rogensack, and I am, you can see, uh, the president changed my title. I'm not the assistant vice president, I'm the associate vice president you were of cultural affairs. I was promoted by you. Thank you. <laughs> Very much so. And I am the executive director of Asian Gambage. 
We were asked to respond to three different questions and then provide a challenge for our president. One of the first things that we were asked to speak about was our practice, traditions, and styles in terms of recruitment, retention, and program development. When I came here from Dartmouth College over 23 years ago, my husband, Kurt Rogensack, and I were walking across campus. And we had just seen a reporter on a television interviewing one of our legislators. And the legislator said, we must stop affirmative action because our colleges are being overrun with those people. So we were walking across the campus, and the campus was out, and people were about, and I said, where are those people? <laughs> like, we came from little tiny Dartmouth College, and it was very diverse. And I went, well, where is everyone? 23 years later, it has changed. But I knew then, in accepting the job and coming here, that part of the responsibility was not just programs and art events on the gamut stage, but it was how to have an impact, not just on this campus, but as President Crow has said, in terms of the greater public that, that we are to be in service to. So one of the first things we did, and in terms of development, is to examine our mission as an organization. And at that time, our mission was proud to present it all. And I sat down with my very large staff and said, what does that mean? And they looked at me like, oh my god, why did they hire her? <laughs> I said, it means nothing. It means nothing to you, it means nothing to me, and it means nothing to our greater communities. And I use that word plural because there is a multiplicity of communities that we serve. As a staff, we collectively came up with our new mission, which serves us well today, and that is connecting communities. So it is through cultural programs, it is through ritualized cultural expression that we connect communities. I want to underscore something that President Crow said about ownership. So when he said we must ha have inclusion at our core, I believe unless everyone owns it, nothing happens. So just by the mere fact that the staff could put together that mission, devise that mission, and say everything we do will be judged against that, every single thing we do. And whether that is our very large Broadway program, whether that is our residency program, whether that are artists we bring to campus to work on the campus as well in the communities, it must be about are we connecting communities. And the word inclusion is an important word because it means everyone. I no longer use the word diversity because that means it's not me. Diverse means different than. Inclusion means it includes everyone. So as we began to look at our programs, I knew that we just couldn't like just do them. We had to look at the staff and evaluate the staff. And what we didn't have was a cultural participation program. Sometimes those programs are called outreach programs, which immediately puts us in a position of here, we're giving this to you. Inreach programs means we're looking at our navel and gazing. Cultural participation means as a group, we are participating together. Now, I knew that it couldn't happen immediately, so really we looked at building a department that was siloed. We looked at the Latino community, we looked at the African American community, we looked at the Native American community, we looked at the Jewish community, we looked at the Asian American community, and specifically I hired staffs to reflect that. And then I said, we are going to do our work on the outside of this university. We are going to build coalition and support groups, and we're going to talk about cultures, because part of connecting communities means we ask three questions when we're working with an artist or a community. What do you want? What do I want? And what do we want together? And unless we know what everyone wants individually, we cannot work together collectively. And so the very first group we worked with was, was the Latino community here in Arizona. I said, what do you want? And they said, representation on the stage, a chance to explain explore and share our culture. But not culture as it's defined in a certain period of time, but culture that's defined from the beginning of time to today. Culture that also is reflective of various class structures. And so we actually worked with a program we call South No Borders and looked at culture that way. Our next exploration was with the Asian communities, and we actually have 14 different Asian communities here in the Valley, and we did a program called Asia Arizona and the arts, and worked with the very beginnings of Asian uh, 
presence here in Arizona, which was through the railroads, and then where it has come today. With the Native American communities, and we have 29 First Nation communities in Arizona, one of the things that often happens with culture is that you lock it in a specific time period. And so we worked with the various communities in terms of what's contemporary culture like. And it was called drawing the lines, and drawing the lines between the past and the present, but also internationally. We worked with a group of um, Aboriginal communities from Darwin and Australia and had gatherings. And I remember being in the Pima Maricopa community, and the president of that community said, you know, while our Australian brothers and sisters have come from so far, our ASU brothers and sisters have actually come a great deal further in our discussions and what we do. And so once we took those silos off, we began to say this work is about cross-cultural. And so we began to look at how those works intersect. We looked at works with um, Jaime Nogoni, who is from Cote d'Ivoire, Africa, and Kota Yamazaki, who is from Japan, and looked at exploring those work cross-culturally and working with those communities cross-culturally. We still do a great deal of that today. But we also begin to look at inclusion on this campus and how and where it's reflected. One of the amazing places that it's reflected, and I am very proud of our campus, is being a number one supporter of military, both veterans and active duty military. I myself am a military brat. The guy to my right is a military brat. So we grew up in communities that were cross-cultural communities. We all lived in the same places on base. We all went to the same schools. So the fact that... Couldn't play with the officers' kids. We lived, we, and we went to different clubs, NCO clubs and officers' clubs, airmen clubs, <clears throat> and we swam in different pools. By based way, on social status. Social status, not based on right. race or religion or anything else, but you're an officer or a non-com. So we looked at the military, which has a great impact on our campus and in our communities, and decided we would approach the issue of looking at inclusion by dedicating six of our programs to that, and really bringing together focus groups and discussions, both non-coms and officers, but to really look at how, as families, those families work and function, and those families who are highly transient, just as we have students who come in for years and leave, we have faculty who come and who go, and administrators who come and go, and design programs around that. And it really ranged from Camille Brown, who will be here with Black Girl Liturgy, to Vijay Iyer, who is an, from India, an American Indian, um, American Indian descent, and really how we can then, through art, have these discussions. One of the things that I find is a challenge for us, I have two minutes, have more to say. Okay, 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 I have so much more to say. You can have one of mine. Okay, 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 okay. But, but I think one of the things that is, is a great challenge for us is how to create safe spaces. So I'll, I'll jump to challenges. So one of the challenges that we have to look at is safe spaces. One of the um, responsibilities that President Crow has given me is to look at our, what is now called Sun Devil Stadium, which we are currently calling Sun Devil Central, and make that a place of inclusion 24-7. Well, I, you know, go Devils. I believe in those seven football games we're gonna have a year, but year round, how is that a place of inclusion? And what makes you want to come to that space? When we met with our students from the design school, and we have really smart students, oh my goodness, and they helped us to think about what that space would be like, I said to the 300 students there, how many of you have ever been in the stadium? And a third of the hands went up. And so then we began to talk about why and what's important. So that notion of how do you make safe space. The other notion is the notion of language and what you call things, not people, what you call these safe spaces will be a great challenge for us. And thirdly, and I see that my time's rapidly disappearing, is I always have a saying, those who choose, those who choose. So when we look at where we're all seat seated here, someone chose President Crow to be here. That happened to have been the Board of Regents. Actually, I was on the search committee. But that happened, again. No, that happened to have been our Board of Regents. Those authorizing environments who choose who will lead us, who then who choose to fill and populate this place is our greatest challenge. Because when you look at those tables, 
Those tables should be reflective of America. It is critical, it is important, because we cannot create these futures if those people who are at those who choose, those who choose, are not reflective of where the country's going. I'm gonna leave it at that. I have a few more things to say, but thank you. First of all, I want to thank Delia Science and uh, Rebecca Sosi, you know, for the opportunity to be part of this panel. Uh, because I'm still fairly new to, the, to ASU, um, I wanted to reflect my comments on my previous stop, which was really as, you know, President and CEO of Chicanos por la Causa. Now, many of you are aware of the history and the impact of an organization like CPLC, but for those of you that are not from Arizona and who don't know that context of, 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 of our community-based organizations, CPLC started as a, as a community advocate, you know, back in 1969 when there was a big movement to, of inclusion and trying to get people to the table that had both influence and a voice, especially for a large Latino population that was emerging, but that was not included at the table, very much in reference to what Dr. Crow, Dr. Crow said you know, previously. And so in many ways, you know, that was the message, that was the, you know, the driving force for both the creation and the growth of CPLC, and a lot of our focus was about not only a seat at the table, but also about having impact and making sure that those that didn't have a voice that were included and were uh, invited you know, to participate. So when I took over CPLC, um, a number of individuals, women, came to me and said, do you realize that CPLC is not inclusive? And I was a little taken back. And I said, really? And I said, yes. CPLC is perceived to be a male-dominated organization. And I was like, oh, wow, OK. The macho you know, came out. And I said, OK, so let's talk about that. Um, and I said, well, again, you know, this is our perception. And perception is reality. And so as I did, and we did a self-awareness and looked at both the makeup of the board and the makeup of our management team, in an organization where 70% of our coworkers are women, and very common in the social service and then in the not-for-profit world, reality was reality. We did not have a board that was reflective. We did not have a management team that was reflective and inclusive of all. And so we could have ignored it. Why? Because we did good work in the community, great work in the community. Or we could have accepted it as a challenge to uh, move forward and make a difference. And the latter is what I chose and my management team chose you know, to act upon. Now, those of you that work with boards and those of you that report to boards and or governance recognize that sometimes changing the face and the makeup of your bosses you know, is a little challenging. And so you have to be patient, you have to be astute, and you have to understand uh, um, when terms expire and so forth, but when you have the will and when you have um, a calling, and in this case, you know, our board in that, at that time only had two females, two women out of 23, there was an obvious disparity that needed to be addressed. But there was also a disparity and a gap in our management, and that was something that we could address quicker and that we could communicate to those individuals outside that had an expectation that this organization that had been established and had been formed because of inclusion, you know, would begin to make a difference. And so we developed a strategy and I developed a commitment, and not just a verbal commitment, but a commitment of action and a commitment of expectation, and one that was communicated both in a loud voice and in a soft voice. Why do I frame it that way? Well, because sometimes you're more effective when you sit at the podium and you demand for things, and sometimes you're more effective when you sit down at the table and have a conversation and explain your expectation as to why it is the right thing to do to have others represented at the table. Um, and so for us, moving the needle and making a difference and ensuring that not only was it just lip service, but that it was reflected and through my term that we were actually um, addressing this issue was very, very important. Now coming to ASU, you know, I'm somewhat the new kid on the block, right? So everybody's nice to me, 
right now, you know, I'm in the honeymoon stage. And so I haven't stepped on a whole lot of toes, you know, I don't think yet. You know, at least I haven't been fired yet or threatened to be fired. But, you know, there's things that I, there's things that I see, right? There's things that I react to. Um, in many ways, my perception of ASU was developed by the media. I still read the paper, not the physical paper, but the online paper, right? I'm still old school. Um, and so when I read the paper, a lot of the things that are portrayed out there and the individuals that represent ASU, if I can say it that way through the media, are President Crow, Coach Graham, Coach Hurley, three white males. Wow. Now, I recognize that our university is more diverse than that. We have Coach Thorne, who is the winningest coach at ASU, and who's a great leader in this organization, and who's gonna take us deep, you know, into the championship. And I expect that many of you will be at the game both Friday and Sunday in support of her. Amen. Right? Because. Women's basketball. Absolutely, uh -huh. right? But there's many other women. You know, um, Christina Wilkinson, you know, very much a leader and somebody that represents this organization both at the corporate officer level and out in the community. And we have Nancy Gonzalez and Jennifer Hightower and Beatriz Rendon, many people who are leaders within our organization, but the media doesn't cover what they do. And from the outside perspective looking in, again, that media, that paper, is often what defines who we are. May not be right, but that's what I read and that's what the community reads. Now, I view inclusion as a work in progress. ASU is a work in progress. We started and have done great strides in the diversity and the access of our students. When I look at faculty, when I look at staff, I believe that's a work in progress. I think we all have that as an ownership and an accountability and nobody needs to come telling us from the outside what should be. I think we know what should be and just by looking at the faces of our students, you know, and asking ourselves a question, do we reflect, do we represent our student body? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Brayboy, and I'm a President's Professor in the uh, Department of Justice and Social Inquiry in the School of Social Transformation. I direct a research center called the Center for Indian Education, and I'm the Special Advisor to the President on American Indian Affairs. So I'm going to sort of address the questions that Professor Science put in front of us um, through an indigenous lens, but it happens to be mine. I'm going to pull in some of what um, my work is, has sort of put in front of us, but let me just start first by recognizing the fact that ASU sits on the ancestral homelands of Akamel Oatham peoples. <clears throat> For me, here's why that's important to lead with, with that. If you look at the design aspirations of the new American University, leveraging our place is at the top of, of that list, but if we're going to engage in some form of inclusion, it really is important for us to know where we sit, where we do that work, for whom, to what end. I think I want to start there. I also just want to quickly thank the Faculty Women of Color Caucus um, and Professor Science for, for pulling us together. So, you know, I tend to focus my work really from a capacity strengthening and building approach. That is, how do we begin to work with tribal nations? How do we work with other communities to build capacity <coughs> within those communities as an educational institution? In some ways, this bumps up against this larger notion of empowerment. And I recognize for, you, for the psychologists in the room, I understand that empowerment is a thing that means something to you all that's different. But for me, lots of us take up empowerment somehow as giving us giving power to other people. And I tend to think that that's not exactly the way that we should be thinking about our work. Instead, we should really be thinking about the fact that we should be recognizing, honoring, engaging, and utilizing the cultural, intellectual, and social knowledges that communities already have. 
That is to say that our communities, the students that come to us, already have power. Part of what we do as an educational institution, what we should be doing if we're going to work towards this notion of inclusion, is providing them with a set of skills, some credentials, so that they can marshal those, deploy those in service of their communities. This charter for me is really important because it's about the success of individuals and society. And if we're going to do that, it seems to me that part of what we've, we need to do is to recognize that people come with a whole, with millennia's worth of knowledge in order to do that work. And so part of what we do is to, I think, really help those students in doing that with the single goal of really to envision and enact their own futures. So that's what my work does. It's the philosophy that I take on, on this is really about fundamentally about building and strengthening capacity in individuals and in communities. If you all haven't seen the video on the charter that's on the president's page, I, I really recommend it. It's five minutes of time really well spent. But part of what comes out of that is really this push toward ASU preparing master learners. And for me, I think it's important that we really engage. It's implied in this, but that we really take a step further. And what we're really doing is we're preparing master learners to become master doers. That's the work that we do. It's the philosophy, it's the philosophy for me that really drives the work that I do. The work, the charter, the institution um, is fundamentally disruptive. What's been put in front of us, the fact that we are guided by, not by whom we exclude, but rather by whom we include, is disruptive in the way in which institutions of higher education generally work. So I think we have to start there if we're gonna think about challenges, is, it, is to then really go back to this question about to whom are we responsible in the work that we do? And for me, it's our students, it's our ASU community, it's the larger state of Arizona, it's a national and international world, but it's also the future inhabitants of this state. I purposefully did not say citizens. It's inhabitants of this state in the future for the work that we do. So there's a challenge for us in how do we listen to ASU community members with a goal really in terms of helping define, helping them sort of define and then engage and enact those futures. So let me just sort of talk for a minute about my 12 and 14 year old sons, Juana and Eli. And I drop them off at school a couple of times a week and I can usually tell what kinds of day they're going to have. Our older boy, Quana, he glides. When he's happy and he's settled and he's ready to do his work, he glides in the school. Our younger boy, Eli, bounces. Mm -hmm. And so I can tell when they're having those days because there's a boy gliding and a boy bouncing next to them. They're walking into school and I think, okay, they're settled, they're engaged, and they're happy. And I think one of our challenges at ASU, fundamental challenges, is for us, how do we engage our community so that they can, our the members can glide and bounce in the ways that make sense to them. Embedded in that really are, are for me, are, are a couple of, of really important challenges. One is, how do we honor gliding in our work when bouncing is the norm? And vice versa. Inclusion for me in part is allowing for bouncing and gliding and sliding and whatever it is without having things narrowly defined. I'll tell you how that manifests itself. A couple of years ago I had a conversation with an unbelievably bright American Indian student finishing her master's degree. She was applying for a job on this campus and she did not get the job. And the feedback she got from this, now this was a job working with students and for students, was that her interview did not move her forward because she did not cite the appropriate people in student um, development theory. That's troubling for me, that we make decisions about who we're going to hire based on whether or not they are citing the right people. Different for faculty members. Okay. And so when we think about, for me, there's a larger question about ownership. And the way I often take up ownership is that people tend to wrap their programs and own them. And for me, that's actually an exclusionary process because they determine who gets in and who gets out. And one of the ways that manifests itself is whether or not someone is citing the appropriate people or not. I think one of the ways that this institution is moving forward is to move towards some sense of stewardship. That is, we are stewards of this institution, of the state, of the country, of the nation, of the community, and our job as stewards is to really include everyone. I'm gonna to return to this in just a, a moment. 
But the other big challenge in terms of thinking about whether or not we glide or we bounce or we do something else in, is really this fundamentally this question about how do we listen within the larger noise of the enormity of this place. It's a huge challenge, I think, for us. And one that I, th I think we've got we've to begin to think more seriously about. So um, let me just, I've got two minutes, right? Let me try to add a couple of solutions, because I think that what academics are really good at is tearing things apart, leaving the rubble and walking away from it and saying, you build it, I want to tear it down again. I don't think that's great for us. Um, truly, it's not. So for me, inclusion is a verb and not a noun. We have to do it. And we have to own it in the ways in which my colleagues have talked about, but we also have to steward it, I think, in really important roles. This example I used earlier about this individual who was pushed out of a job because she didn't cite the appropriate theorists, I think for me it counts to the fact that one of the things we need to do is make the terms of engagement explicit. What are the expectations? So that everyone is working from a pretty similar and common theme, we need to make policies open, instructive, and enabling. At the moment, there are times when they feel closed, punitive, and disabled. So let's, let's start there. I would recommend that we have a series of, of difficult dialogues. This should not be the first one, but we should really have interactive dialogues around hard things. I listen to our public officials talk about political correctness to shut down those conversations. As an educational institution, we should be doing more than that. And rather than just dialoguing, we should end those with actionable items that we take to our educational leaders um, in the work that we do. And then I think the, the, the last thing I want to say is what I'm really sort of dancing around here and I want to be more explicit about is I think this work of inclusion, we have to be deliberate. That doesn't mean slow for me, it means focused and intentional in creating pathways for ASU community members to follow or to reject and find ways, really fundamentally, this is a call to make inclusion part of our DNA, both literally and in our practice. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brian and colleagues. Uh, my name is Ray Anderson, and I'm the uh, director of athletics. And uh, I will tell you that uh, uh, before I came here, my entire career was spent in the private sector, uh, in sports, a lot of it professional sports. So uh, I don't mean to uh, sound harsh, because in the private sector, particularly the place that I most recently came from, the NFL, uh, it was uh, strictly business. Uh, and so uh, I learned quickly uh, and then throughout my time in the private sector, mostly in football, that uh, it was determined uh, that diversity and inclusion uh, was not just right in terms of culture and core values uh, and all the things that have been listed, uh, but diversity and inclusion, very frankly, was just good business. It was just flat out good business because the demographics uh, continue to uh, demonstrate that uh, women, mothers, had big impact on sales and who played and who didn't play and uh, whether you got hot dogs and chips and Coca-Cola at the game. Uh, so that uh, it was just good business. It, it was perceived as the right thing to do, but also good business because it gave you many more opportunities to engage uh, with a broader uh, sector of consumers. Uh, and so that was uh, uh, really something that really hit me. Uh, and so my first job in the public sector uh, is here uh, at ASU and athletics. And what I can tell you is that core value, inclusion, diversity, culturally, they all go together, uh, but also very frankly in athletics, inclusion and diversity for us is strictly, in addition, I shouldn't say strictly, it is also very good business because we are trying to recruit and, and, and sell uh, young men and women and their parents on what we are here. Uh, and so, in able to do that effectively, we've got to represent those folks who are coming in. Uh, and so it's actually very right, but also very necessary that our senior folks and the folks who 
touch our student athletes and their family and uh, convince them and frankly recruit and sell ASU to them reflect who they are. Uh, and so it is not just right, but it's also very appropriate for us uh, in, in our senior position, our management positions, and indeed in our head coaching positions uh, to reflect diversity. Uh, we are a work in progress uh, on that front. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, but we don't lose sight of the fact at all that in addition to being right, it's also very necessary uh, if we're going to accomplish what we aspire to be. Uh, and that is we want to be a place where everybody knows uh, that you're going to be surrounded by folks who care about you. It's going to be an inclusive, very diverse environment and culture in which you are able to study uh, and grow and compete. Uh, so uh, I, I want to be honest and tell you that uh, it is also very important to uh, who we are. It's very important to our philosophy at Sun Devil Athletics is that of the surrogate parents. And what that means is when you deliver your son or daughter to us, uh, you are delivering them to an environment and a culture uh, that really views them as our surrogate children. So when you drive away, you need to be comfortable that you're leaving them with folks who will care about them as if they were your own child, as if they are our own children. Uh, and very frankly, uh, there is a higher comfort level for uh, the variety of folks who leave their kids with us when very frankly they know that there's folks who look like me, uh, we have women, uh, we have uh, brown skin folks, they need to understand that they're living, leaving them with a community that really is diverse and reflective of where they're from. Uh, and that's really important to us. So it's a work in progress. We've got more to do uh, to be inclusive and diverse in our senior ranks, but we make it a, a point. Uh, uh, of importance, a critical point of importance. One of the biggest challenges we have in doing uh, what we want to do uh, in diversity and inclusion uh, is uh, we constantly have to make sure uh, we're not succumbing to the argument uh, or the excuse that, well, you know, there's just not anybody in the pipeline. There's just not a folks, enough folks there and ready. Uh, there's just not uh, enough that we can really uh, uh, identify and pursue, uh, well, uh, our philosophy on that is that's just an excuse. Uh, if you look hard enough and work hard enough, uh, I think you will find that the pipeline, in fact, exists, uh, and it's our job and our challenge to make sure uh, that we're being robust uh, in figuring out uh, the pipeline capacity because it is there. It's an excuse when folks say it's not. That's our view, and I would say is good business. Uh, you, you should probably uh, do likewise. Uh, one of the things in my career that uh, I am most uh, proud of is that I was, in fact, involved in one of those uh, force uh, diversity and inclusion movements in the NFL. It was called the Rooney Rule. Uh, and that is the rule that uh, some years ago, uh, Commissioner Tagliabue got a number of the owners and working group executives from clubs together to say, we are going to have to force uh, 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 inclusion uh, when you're talking about uh, higher level position coaches, presidents, general managers in particular. Uh, and that forced uh, inclusion method, while sometimes uh, may not work, it certainly worked in that regard. It certainly worked in NFL to a degree uh, because it, it, it just forced, forced uh, 32 uh, very rich guys who typically uh, would not look to f too far out of their own comfort zone, it really forced them to have to at least uh, recognize that there are some other things going on out here in the world. Uh, and so one of the things that we are going to do as uh, representatives of uh, ASU athletics is we're going to take a leadership role. If in not doing something uh, akin to the Rooney Rule, certainly uh, uh, the spirit and intent uh, is with the NCAA is to go in and essentially uh, uh, force a culture change, force a recognition that uh, you really do have to convince uh, the Division I uh, presidents and chancellors and, and folks making these decisions on who are going to lead your programs that uh, they, they, they must 
realize that there really is a pipeline uh, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, we've got to make it a mandate, uh, a best practice, a cultural uh, imperative uh, at the NCAA level uh, to do more uh, akin to what they've done in the NFL. So uh, we are taking a leadership role uh, in that. Uh, one of President Crow's good friends, Mark Emmert, is the president of the NCAA. Uh, he's committed to pushing that forward. Uh, there are a number of uh, ADs, particularly minority ADs, who are taking the lead. And so uh, we hope to, uh, as a member of uh, this esteemed uh, university, uh, play a key role in making some strides on diversity and inclusion uh, at the NCA level as well. Advancing diversity and inclusion, and Colleen, I do like uh, that uh, you are strictly inclusion. Uh, I, I kind of like that, so I, if I borrow that uh, Please going do. forward, uh, I, I, I like that concept. Uh, so that uh, inclusion uh, for us in, in, in some level athletics as part of this uh, uh, family uh, is just natural. Uh, it's objective. Is that what it is, professional uh, Professor uh, Crow? Is it, what did you call it? You went to Stanford and Harvard, not me. <laughs> it, is the, it is the objective. It is the, the way it is. It is cultural. It is core value. All of those things, it is indeed. Uh, and so uh, uh, we will uh, do our part in representing. Uh, I, went to, I went to moo you. <laughs> uh, to make sure that uh, we're doing our part to... Uh, make this a, a, a better place, uh, hopefully for a whole lot more people. Thank you. Wow, I didn't even have to play the role of enforcer. Well, maybe once. But um, very inspirational thoughts. Um, food for all of us to chew on, not just right now, but going forward. I, we do have time for some questions, so I'm going to read the list that was submitted. Um, and I'm going to uh, give President Crow first shot. Anybody can answer these, but if you wish to, you can take any of them. Um, primarily because he has to leave. I believe there's a, a meeting with the governor, so we appreciate your willingness to spend time with us this morning. A meeting the governor has requested my attendance at, even though he's in Washington. So. Okay. All right. Oh. <laughs> so I'm just going to throw these three questions out there. Um, and again... Feel free to respond. Uh, the first question is, how do we translate this vision of inclusion to our students, given the complexities and the context in which they reside? Another one is, what are your thoughts on the national demonstrations going on at colleges and universities around the country? And what are the implications for the dynamics here at ASU? And the third, which is kind of unfair, but I think Mark is right here. What is the provost doing? I'm, I, I did not change the question. That's the way it came in. Should we bring a chair? <laughs> well, maybe I'll take uh, each of those questions. Um, uh, on the first one, this sort of vision of inclusion for our students. So the, major the vast majority of our students are uh, what I call late millennials. They were born after 1994. Uh, I refer to them as millennial nets, millennial dot nets. They are uh, inextricably altered by these devices. Uh, and those of us that are slightly older than them, or even uh, significantly older than them, like me, uh, we don't really fully grasp what that means. There's no way for us to grasp it. It means that they know everything instantly. They have access to everything instantly. They are overwhelmed with information. If they choose to be, or if they choose not to be, it's an unbelievable uh, device for, uh, in my view, egalitarian enhancement. It's an unbelievable set of device I'm using technology for inclusion. So our students have unbelievably high expectations for the environment when they come to the university. They assume it is inclusive. All this stuff about the way the world used to be, for the most part, our students have rejected it. Happily so. They believe that our society is and should be inclusive. There are certainly exceptions to that but those are at the individual level now, as opposed to uh, as uh, you know, huge groups, large groups, 
uh, they may be existing in our society, they're not existing within this institution. And so I think that the vision for inclusivity uh, for our students is really one of empowering them to take our actualization process as a democracy to the higher, to higher levels, doing everything we can to empower them. To the second issue on uh, national demonstrations and other things like uh, things that went on at the University of Missouri and uh, lots of other schools, uh, you know, I, I just think uh, that uh, for whatever reason, universities are too bureaucratic. They're too mechanistic. They, they, you know, they're not engaged in real life, in real change. And we are an institution committed to real change and, and real life. And to, and, and to be committed to that, to be focused on that, means that, that you have to be listening. And uh, academic administrators, university leaders must, must have a we're not, back to Ray's point, you know, we're not corporations, we're not businesses. We are places where people gather to learn from each other. That means then that's, if, if inclusion is a core objective and learning is the core process, all your behavior should be reflective of those two things. And that means you don't, you don't not engage, you engage. You don't not listen to, to a group of students that feel rightfully that they are being disparaged or being thought of in negative ways. You must engage, you must remedy, you must solve, you must work towards resolu resolution. You must engage, engage, engage. And that, I don't think, has been happening at the level necessary for the speed of social transformation that's now occurring, partly driven by high expectations, which are justified, partly driven by uh, the availability of knowledge and information and news and so forth, which is also speeding things along. As to the provost, who's sitting right here, Mark Searle, uh, you know, his job is uh, one of the, it's, within our society, the job of the university provost is unbelievably complex because uh, one has to deliver academic quality from the faculty while delivering also from the faculty uh, a commitment to the culture of inclusion, demonstrations of inclusivity in the faculty itself and its expression. And, and I, don't, I don't just mean ethnic uh, inclusion, actually more along the lines, Delia, that you said at the beginning, you know, both visible and invisible uh, uh, measures of inclusion because it is that. It's not just a person's outward physical appearance, but who is the person? You know, how do they think? And, and, and what else do they represent? And so forth. It's all of those things. And so the provost's job is to deliver that inclusivity as an objective with unbelievable academic excellence at the same time in a way where others that can deliver only one or neither can clearly see that we can deliver both. And that's, that's an unbelievable challenge for the provost. So. I would like to follow up what President Crow just said and, and talk about the mandate that he has given us in terms of working across disciplines and across campus. And I see Stephen Tepper is here in the audience and he is our Dean of Haida of the Herberger Institute of Design and the Arts. And one of the things that Stephen is doing and we are supporting that effort is our students are not only learning their craft and learning cultural education, but they are applying that into the communities that we serve. And through this particular program that Dean Tepper is putting forward, our students will take their skill and their knowledge and their talent to solve real issues in the community. I think that's something that President Crow has led us all on that journey. And for our students in particular, it's not just what you're doing in the classroom, it's once you leave the classroom and you make commitments to communities and know that what you learn in the classroom art and culture can help solve other issues in the community. And I think that's where we get that transference of national issues that are happening there and how we address them. For those of you that read the paper, recently the city of Phoenix um, was challenged with an opportunity to step up and be inclusive of other religions and other faith. And they punted. They passed the buck and watered down a decision that I believe would have sent a huge, a huge message about their values as an inclusive community. 
And so what that means is that there was a group, for those of you that did not read the paper, there was a group that believed in, in, in uh, satanic belief. Don't look at so, me. Well, <laughs> <laughs> not because he believes that. I'm but, just wondering where you're yeah. going to take this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and again, okay. in a certain view, yeah. right? You know, in, 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 in accepting challenges and making decisions, sometimes are, are not popular, right? What, what's happening across the country, there's issues that are not popular, but are things that, you know, are real and in many ways are the hard conversations that we're not having. So as a university, and as a university that believes to be a leader, we have to bring those conversations forward and not punt, not pass the buck when they present themselves. That's something that I believe stages like this, opportunities like this to have conversations is really key. But beyond having a conversation, what is the action? What is the follow-up? What is the follow-through in this? So when the city of Phoenix went through a different process, that particular group went to Scottsdale. And now the same conversation happened in Scottsdale. And if it gets tested in Scottsdale, it'll go to Gilbert, it'll go to Tucson, it'll go somewhere else. Well, again, it's not, it's not gonna end. So why, should, why shouldn't we, as a university that is trying to be open and is trying to be represented, reflect of our community, also address those types of issues, right? Let's not be forced into a conversation. Let's ourselves realize what some of those hard, hard conversations need to be, and let's proactive, be proactive to have them. In terms of translating this for our students, I, again, I think that inclusion is a, we really should engage it as a verb and do this. But I think there's something that really important, Vice President Anderson mentioned earlier, this notion of um, f sort of filling the pipeline and thinking about pipeline issues around the Rooney Rule and other things. I think we have an important role here in really thinking seriously about succession planning. What are, this, and this is really gets back to my, my earlier point about stewardship. What are we doing to create the next generation of thinkers and leaders and doers, people who are making these hard decisions? I think part of the way we translate this is by really living what inclusion is supposed to look like and helping our students understand the nuances in that and being really explicit in that work that, that we do with them. And I, I, I think sometimes, because we've gone through this system, we take for granted the fact that we need to help our students understand where those steps are, lead them in that direction, then let them go, make some mistakes, learn from those mistakes, and, and grow from them. So I think we have a really important role in translating this with our students in terms of, of succession planning. Missouri, Williams, Yale, U UCLA, you name it. For me, I think the importance of all of that for us is really about how do we start to engage in these difficult dialogues how do we press our public servants to not hide behind labels that mean, I'm not sure what they mean, I don't know what politically correct means, to have conversations about things that are happening to people, that are excluding people, that are harming people. Why aren't we talking about those? And I agree that we as an institution, particularly this institution, have an opportunity to begin to engage in those conversations and really stick some teeth into those and start holding people responsible. For me, it feels like we have an opportunity here rather than being right, to do right. And it, that's one of the things that I think can help guide this, and continue to guide this institution in terms of a leader in this conversation. I'll just simply say, uh, my belief is that you, you, you just gotta show them. They've gotta be able to walk in and look around and understand that uh, you mean it when you say, uh, this is an inclusive environment. So. You can engage them, you can chit chat, you can all do all that. But when they come into our building, they have to just see it. Thank you. Thank you. I will ask Mark if he wants to make a statement because in all fairness, that question came out of the blue. Well, it came out of the blue for you. I that's not unusual. Uh, you know, the, the, my job is to uh, do a lot of different things, uh, some of which the president captured. Um, 
But in, with respect to inclusion, to me, the, the issue is just what was being talked about here, which is we have to walk the talk, which is it's not just enough to talk about who we're recruiting or attempts to recruit or the attempts to retain the key faculty and the key staff that really make the uh, academic enterprise successful. We have to do it, and we have to operationalize that, and it's through the work with the deans, the department chairs, and the other academic leaders through which we get that accomplished, and it's my job to help them see the pathway to get that done. We have separate, we also have initiatives and programs to drive those kinds of things, but <laughs> it's critical that it become part of our mindset, not just something that's out here that it's something separate from, uh, that it's, a, it's an integrated part of our being as to how we're going to build the academic enterprise and make it successful. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay, rather than pick another item from the list, I really um, want to ask if you have anything that any one of you wants to add, either in response to the other speakers or thoughts that came along during this period of discussion. You know, one of the things that, that I would just like to say is, is the notion of cross-disciplinary work is pivotal. And especially since I come from a cultural arts background, the notion that art and science is pivotal, the notion that art and athletics is pivotal, and I'll use an example. Ray and I and uh, Ray's wife Buffy were all getting together just discussing a series of things, and Ray had seen this amazing work called Black Angels Over Tuskegee about the Tuskegee Airmen. And he said, you know what I really loved about that, Colleen? I said, what? He says, it's about leadership. And I want to help our athletes understand their responsibilities as civic leaders. Let's work together to bring that here. And in case in point, we did that. And not only was it moving for a number of communities, because we also had school children there, as well as the performers interacted with our own students, but there was a young athlete, and she stood up and she said three things. She said, one, I didn't know the story. Two, I didn't know how moved I would be about the story. And three, I didn't know how it would impact my role as a leader in athletics. And it accomplished all of those things through the arts. And the thought of arts and athletic being combined may seem athenomistic, but it was not. And so I think to begin to really think about each of the roles and areas that you as faculty play, and whether your discipline is chemistry, volcanology, my husband's a volcanologist, I don't say that. There's a way for the arts to intersect. I just have a quick comment, and then Delia, I have to, I have to race out. I apologize. Uh, I want to make sure that we understand what inclusivity means, because this institution uh, making inclusivity an objective then is able in the early part here of the 21st century, using technology and other tools and mechanisms, has a way to defeat the lack of inclusivity in other parts of our society by overwhelming those parts of our society where it's not been possible to attain inclusivity by projecting our value system. Our value system is projected by the tools and the devices and the mechanisms that our staff and our faculty and our students are able to conceive of, partner with others, and advance, and I'll give you an example. So there are large numbers of high schools in Arizona that have never had a single child graduate from any college or community college ever. Ever. Those are mostly poor kids, and many of them are minority kids. No one has ever gone to college. Now, it doesn't mean, it, does, it says nothing about their ability, nothing, nothing. It means that they have not had the ability to access the environment that we have created. There are a million people in Arizona, slightly more than that, who attended college and never graduated, have no degree. Half of the median income families in the United States, which are heavily minority, have received Pell Grants from the government to attend a college or a community college and over half of them have no degree today. That is an unmitigated social failure. Our institution now in the realms that we're operating in, we have a full immersion 
on-campus, technology-enhanced learning environment, you're sitting in one of the spaces of that environment. We have a digital immersion, online technology-enhanced learning environment. We have 20,000 students in that, 5,000 of which are from Starbucks. The diversity of those students is increasing and significant. We have a third realm that we operate in called our Global Freshman Academy, which offers to any person, anywhere, without any barrier whatsoever, access to our faculty and our learning environment at no cost until such time as you want to have a, an accreditation for that, but the learning environment is at no cost. Our Me3 tool developed inside ASU allows any child anywhere to dream about the future and to find a path to an educational pathway and an educational success. So I am a big believer in moving past theoretical discussions about how the world ought to be. Like I don't really want to listen to those anymore because we know how it ought to be. It's obvious how it ought to be. It's obvious what we need to do to be able to get there. Now we have to become, back to my opening comments, an institution built around a theory of action. Are we operating at a social scale to be inclusive? Are we operating in all of our learning environments to be inclusive? Have we kept ourselves accessible to anyone who wants to learn? Have we eliminated financial barriers for people that happen to be raised as children without much money from their parents? Have we made certain that any child from any background has access to the assemblage of talent that we've put together here in an unencumbered way? And then when they get here, and this has not been the case in the past, when they get here, will they be able to complete either in our full immersion environment, our online envir environment, our massive scale online environment, will they be able to, to complete? It turns out something that we've learned in the Starbucks program. So 70,000 people that work for Starbucks went to college and never finished. And they're the audience that we're focusing on. They are unbelievably, not to every person, but upset. In our society, what do we call a person that didn't finish college? A dropout. It's a pejorative term. Our entire educational system is built the, around the notion of exclusion, scarcity, hierarchy, and social status. You want inclusion to work, you want our society to be more successful, we must defeat that. And so we are all at an institution working at a very substantial scale to defeat that. And so again, the theory of action here is inclusion is our reason for existence to make the democracy work. So with that, I have to race off. So I apologize, and Delia, I apologize. Again. Thank you, President Crow. Um, and we really are very close up to our finishing time, so I'm going to ahead, go ahead and close. And those of you who may want to come up and uh, chat briefly with any of our panelists, please feel free to do that. Um, I want to say two things as, I, as, I, as we depart here. First of all, I think somebody mentioned earlier, uh, Brian, and I will uh, echo his sentiments, and that is that it is always preferable to do the right thing over the easy thing, okay? So the work of inclusion presents challenges, but it also presents opportunities, and we simply cannot avoid those challenges. We need to own them, seize them, and take those opportunities to grow inclusion and to be a model for the rest of the world. Secondarily, in closing, I want to paraphrase from a song that I think uh, was published in 1994 by a fellow named Marty Hagen. And again, I'm paraphrasing liberally, so those of you who may recognize some parallels, please be forgiving. So basically, I just want to say, let us all build a schoolhouse where all can learn, dream, thrive, teach, and serve the greater good where all are welcome. Have a wonderful afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you.